Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday's Worship. And uh, let's commence with a word from the Scriptures from Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Loving God, as we come to worship you this morning, we pray that we would be just in our actions with people that we would not be biased from our own point of view. We come with humility and we ask that you would walk with us, that we could walk humbly with you as we share in this, this time of service with our fellow believers. Teach us to show mercy to each other. In Jesus' name, Amen. Two readings I've selected this morning come from Genesis chapter 37, verse 12 to 28. Now his brothers had gone to graze in their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, <coughs> your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers, and go with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off the valley, to the valley of Hebron, from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They've moved on from here, he, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. When they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Now come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said to them. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meat, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up the blood? Let's Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. So his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite mer merchants came by his, by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. And the New Testament reading I've taken is from uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 23. Immediately Jesus made the disciples go into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, when, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the, to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and was beginning to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Loving God, as we... Uh, come to you this morning 
we are aware that sometimes we're a little bit frightened to get out of the boat. We love the security of who we are and where we are. And yet, Lord, we live in a world that is, at the moment, very stormy with coronavirus, with uh, fears of outbreaks, with all sorts of things going on around us. And Lord, sometimes it seems secure to stay where we are. We're in a part of the world that is safe. But Lord, we ask, you call us to come out of the boat, to come out of our security and sometimes put a toe in the water and take a daring step with you. So Lord, this morning as we share this word, we pray that we would be willing to step out when you call us, when you say come, that we would not shirk our responsibilities, but we would be in tune to your voice calling us to do your will. Lord, we pray that we would be the people who follow you and are obedient to every call you bring us, even if it means stepping out into things that are unknown to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the earliest words that a child ever learns is why. Why this? Why that? And it's a word that sometimes can grate on us because we seem to find that children are very inquisitive and when you have a family, a small family, a young family, that word why comes up again and again. But the why comes through us, right through to adulthood. We find ourselves looking at the world and saying, why? Why is this happening? Why do certain things happen to people? And as I read this passage, the, the why came to me, I thought, why did Peter jump out of the boat? Why did he get out of the boat? What persuaded Peter to, to walk on water? Maybe it was his impulsiveness. Peter was one of those people who sometimes jumped out without even thinking and sometimes our impulsiveness can land us in deep water. Maybe he had a genuine desire for Christ. Maybe he was just overcome by the moment and his love for Jesus got him doing that. But then maybe too he was grandstanding. Maybe he thought, well, you know, I'm going to show these people that I can walk on water. After all, if we look through the previous part of the passage, of the, that passage in, um, in Matthew, we find that Jesus fed the 5,000. And when the 5,000 were, um, were being fed, there was no food for them. He didn't turn to Peter, but he turned to Philip and said, where can we find these? And it wasn't Peter that came forward with the solution, it was Andrew. And maybe there was a little bit in Peter's heart that said, well, I need to show them that I'm the one who's in charge. We don't know exactly why, but there are certain reasons that could come into our minds. And I think about the disciples when they saw Peter getting out of the boat. I wonder what they thought. Were they supportive or were they saying, there goes Peter again trying to make a show for himself. Or maybe they were just frightened. As I look at that little part, I find that it's a bit like church dynamics. There are some people who are up front all the time, out in the front, and people see them all the time. We had, uh, in one church I was in, we had a sharing time. And there was one person who always had something to share. And as she came out with a broad smile on her face, you could see some people in the congregation saying, oh, here we go again. And, uh, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? I, I often like the Quakers idea where people just sit quiet and, uh, and wait until God speaks to one of them. And I was talking to one of the Quakers about that one day and he said, yes, Russ, the trouble is that it's often that God speaks to the same person all the time and we hear that same voice. There are also people who, who want to stay in the boat. They don't want to change, but they criticise everybody who does. The church is an interesting mix of people. And as we that, oh, if I refer back to that Old Testament reading, I could see an interesting mix of people there. There were the, the people who were for Leah, <laughs> the people who were for Rachel. And uh, so we had two divisions of people on there and their sons of those people had, I'm sure there was conflict and, and uh, rivalry amongst those two groups. And of course, among that, you had Joseph, Jacob, I should say, 
who um, favoured one over the other, one group over the other. And he particularly favoured Joseph. But they were all in the one family. And these people, these disciples, were all in the one boat. And as a church, we need to realise that although we are different, although sometimes we get upset with each other, and I look at the, the um, occupants of that boat, there was Philip, who was the shy one. There was Peter, who was impulsive. There was Matthew, who'd been an exploiter of people. There was Thomas, questioning, inquiring. There was Andrew, who seemed to have some logical, um, logical insight into situations. Completely different people, but all in the one boat. All in the one boat. Sometimes the boat can be uncomfortable. Sometimes church can be uncomfortable, but we are called by Christ to be his followers. And we are to take into account each other. In the book of Colossians, in verse chapter 3, it says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish each other with wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Those are verses that I go to again and again when I find myself getting frustrated with other people in the church. But the boat is in amongst the storm. <laughs> They're going, we're going through a stormy period at, the, at present with the way things are in the world. We're going through a stormy period as Christians in the Western world where the church seems to be declining and losing meaning for many. It, the storm can be overwhelming. But we need to realise that the storm is out of, out of our control. The storm is out of our control. And sometimes when we're in the storm, we find that the rug is pulled out from under our feet or like Peter, the water seems to swallow us up. And that's when we're in the storm, we need to call out to Jesus. And Jesus reaches out and he grabs us. And he says, why do you have such little faith? Why do you doubt me? You notice that when Peter started to sink, Jesus didn't say, oh, it serves you right. <laughs> his faith was in Christ. His salvation was not in his works. And when the storms are around us, we can do one of two things. We can bat up the hatches and stay in the boat, or we can get out. Which one do we do? Which one we do depends on what Jesus is saying to us. As he said to Peter, come. We need to come and put ourselves out of the boat. When sometimes the word is to stay. But whatever it is in the storms of life, we need to turn and seek direction from what Jesus is telling us. Sometimes it mightn't be clear. Sometimes we need to put a toe in the water and see if that's where Jesus is taking us. And finally, I want to reflect on Jesus. I, I just want to go through those passages. When we look at all four passages, um, they all four Gospels, they all talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all mention that. And Matthew and Mark, um, all of them mention also the walking on water. Those two things seem to go together. The feeding of the 5,000, the walking on water. But Matthew and Mark also mention the beheading of John. Let's have a look at that sequence. The beheading of John, probably one of Jesus' best friend. And he wants to get time alone. So he goes to try and get time alone. And what happens to people follow him? And he has compassion on them. So he feeds the 5,000. Then he sends the disciples away. He wants to get on his own again. But all of a sudden, he realises that his disciples are in trouble and he walks on water. The important thing here is that sometimes we think Jesus is too busy to have time for us. And yet in the time of distress in his life, in the time when 
he was wanting to be alone. The need and the call was there and he responded to that in a compassionate way. Jesus performs incredible miracles and we have two of them there. The feeding of the 5,000, I've heard some people say, oh, that we can explain that away because maybe because Jesus was generous, other people put food in the baskets and so that's why there was so much. It wasn't really a miracle. And maybe you could explain that, but you can't explain how Jesus walked on water. You either believe it or you don't. And if you believe it and you see Jesus performing the miracles he does, then like the disciples, you say, truly, you are the Son of God. That's a challenge for us today. Even in the middle of crisis, do you trust? Do you trust Jesus? Are you prepared to trust Jesus irrespective of how difficult the storms are? Are we working together as a church and God's people in spite of our differences to be prepared to put a toe in the water and see where Jesus is taking us? Let's pray. Loving God, as we consider that well-read passage, we wonder about the call you have on our life. You call us not only to come, but you call us to work together because we're in the same boat. In spite of who we are as a church, you make a richness rather than out of our differences, rather than an opposition to each other. So Lord, you've called each of us with our incredible single gifts to be a unity for you. Teach us to come, to trust and to follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.